I think we can go ahead and get started then. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming to our, our session today, uh, Understanding Learning Analytics, a multi-institute undergraduate focus group study of learning analytics scenarios. Uh, my name is Michael Perry. I'm the head of assessment and planning at Northwestern University, and I'm joined by my colleague. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Kyle Jones. I'm an assistant professor at Indiana University, Indianapolis, within the School of Informatics and Computing in the Department of Library and Information Science. All right, and then I uh, do want to thank our other research collaborators uh, who couldn't be here today, uh, who've helped make all this research that we're going to share with you possible. Uh, so thank you so much to our entire team. And especially thank you to IMLS for funding. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the funding of uh, this in a little bit, uh, this project, and really making this. Um, possible. So thank you so much, uh, IMLS. So a little bit about what we'll be talking about today. I'm going to give a brief introduction to the project, uh, and then we're going to, uh, some of the research that we've done has led us to this point. Uh, and then we'll be talking about the third phase of this research project, which were learning analytic uh, scenario focus groups. Right? We'll talk about some emerging key findings that we uh, found from uh, the data as we began to analyze it. Uh, talk about some discussion points and things that we've really found interesting and want to share with you. And then leave some time for questions and discussions at the end. We're really interested in uh, what, you guys, what you all think about the scenarios that we presented and our findings so far. I don't know why it's doing that. All right, so an introduction to the project. Um, why are we doing this? Well, when we started this project uh, about four years ago now, mm -hmm. uh, there was little research into learning analytics and specifically about student privacy and the student perspective of those privacy issues. Um, so as we were beginning to look into this, we found no one had really asked students what you thought about these things and tried to measure that. So with that, we came up with some guiding research questions uh, that have carried us through this whole project. How do learning analytics initiatives align with or run counter to student except, uh, expectations of privacy? And how might libraries maximize the benefits of learning analytics while still also respecting those student expectations, right? So how can we do learning analytics in a way that does respect students? Um, again, thank you to IMLS. Uh, we authored a proposal, Getting to Know Their Data Doubles. Uh, this was funded in May of 2018, uh, just over half a million dollars in funding. Uh, we did, because of COVID-related issues, uh, extend the project into April of 2022. Um, the scenarios, the focus groups, uh, we'll talk about the move virtual, but that was slightly disrupted because of COVID. So what are the goals of this project? Really, any learning analytics practice or technology that should be informed by the student perspective. Somewhere we need to be able to say, we understood what students would think about this and we accounted for that, right? So our individual goals then were to identify the reactions, both positive and negative, to learning analytics, right? To understand those privacy expectations and preferences, especially amongst specific demographic groups where the data allowed. So we're really interested in what a lot of different student types think about these things. And we really want to recommend information policy and especially technology design changes to institutional administrators, right? We want to make sure you are all equipped with understanding what those student expectations are, right? And then also able to take that into your planning for these things. All right, so we had three research phases. Um, I don't know why it's too oops, Apologies. <laughs> so the first phase, uh, we conducted semi-structured interviews with students uh, across eight institutions. Each institution did about 15 interviews, uh, really to understand generally what students thought about learning analytics, what their expectations of privacy were, and specifically how that related to academic libraries. Uh, using that information, we launched phase two, where we developed a survey to then field sort of at mass um, to undergraduate students uh, within each of those uh, researchers' institutions. And then finally, that brings us to phase three, where we ran a series of scenario-based focus groups with students to explore the applications of learning analytics and what they thought about very real learning analytics scenarios. So phase one, as we mentioned, semi-structured interviews with undergraduate students. We really wanted to know about generally how they felt about data mining and analytics practices and how they felt about the existence of those things within higher education, and then specifically in relation to the library. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, we did write up the findings, and you can find the article in the citation uh, below um, with the results of those 120-ish uh, uh, interviews that we did with students. 
Um, so we used all that information that we learned in phase one to launch phase two, where we wanted to conduct a survey at each of the institutions with undergraduate students, really to see those themes that we found in those 15 interviews, did those carry true if we looked at students in much larger numbers? Um, the results from this one are, will be published soon in library quarterly, uh, so you can look forward to that one as well. Just real quick, Mike, oh. remind everybody what the in was for phase two. How many students did we have participate? It was about 2,200? 20, yeah, just over 2,000. Yeah, so we had about 2,000 student responses uh, into the survey. And that brings us to phase three, the one we really want to talk about in depth here and share findings from with you, the learning analytics scenario focus groups. So we wanted to take those insights that we gained in those first two phases and use those to develop three future focused scenarios to have students discuss in a focus group, right? To really present them an actual learning analytics scenario, have them talk through it. Uh, so the goal is to conduct three focus groups at each of the seven institutions. So we did a total of 21 focus groups. And the really important thing and why we wanted to do focus groups to talk about this, we wanted the students to reach consensus around themes of trust and privacy, and we'll talk about explicitly what we mean by those in a minute, how they relate to the scenario, right? So what we wanted were, were those focus groups to be able to come together and say this group of students came to agreement that these are the conditions that they felt this technology would be uh, acceptable for them, right? And hopefully then we can use that to really clearly map how we develop learning analytics initiatives. So I've mentioned learning analytics a lot. What do we mean by that? Um, you can find the traditional definition of learning analytics right there, which we, uh, everyone sort of refers to uh, it. But the one thing we really wanted to make clear, especially as we develop these scenarios, learning analytics often is talked about in, in understanding learning, right, and learning outcomes and how to increase those efficiencies. But when we talked to students, especially in the earlier phases, one of the things that became really clear was that students think about a lot of other things that the data is going to be used for. What came up a lot was, especially as we talked about the library, optimizing resource allocations and then hopefully improving institutional efficiencies, right? Is the, can the library use data to better buy stuff so that I have access to resources? Wonderful. No, we can tie that to a learning outcome, obviously, um, as well, but it's a little bit of a different flavor than as we normally talk about it. The other one that came up a lot was safety, well-being, and security. This has especially changed in response to the pandemic where a lot more data collection has happened, right? And we're, we're now much more interested in location tracking, where people are, are they the right people to be there, those kind of things. Um, but this came up a lot in, in both the interviews um, and the focus groups as well, that sense of using data to provide a secure environment for students. So a little bit more expansive than just actually measuring learning. Yeah, and just one comment on that. I mean, we see this in the library literature a lot too about how um, academic librarians are scoping out learning analytics is, yes, being about learning and learning outcomes and we wanna know the relationship between what students are able to gain uh, with regard to their learning and how they're using library resources and spaces and, and interacting with personnel. But the library literature also suggests that that's politically valuable for the library mm -hmm. too by knowing these things, by doing this type of analysis. And that political value also has financial implications. If we can prove our value to administrators and to other, other stakeholders in the institution, uh, then that will help sustain financially the library and that is a connection uh, to learning analytics. All right, and I mentioned privacy and trust. Those are the big sort of overarching themes we wanted to talk about in these uh, focus groups. So what do we mean by that? Well, privacy, we're talking about a student's right to have identifiable student data and information collected, stored, and utilized by the institution, but for authorized purposes, right? Uh, trust, we're talking about a student's willingness to be a, vulner a vulnerable party in the relationship with this institution, right, and those actors, right? So they have trust in the institution, trust that the data will be used, kept secure, used for their benefit. So what were the research questions that guided us as we developed these scenarios and launched this research? First and foremost, what expectations do students hold regarding trust and privacy as we just defined them in relation to the scenarios that we developed? What alterations to those scenarios affect the acceptability of the scenario, right? If you start to change parts of the scenario, does it become more acceptable to students, less acceptable? 
And finally, what trust and privacy conditions do students agree have to be in place for the scenario to be acceptable? Again, reaching consensus so that we can really drive those groups of students to come up with what they view as an acceptable um, idea. So what, how did we develop these scenarios? What we w decided we wanted to do was futurize these scenarios. And by that we mean develop scenarios that push the boundaries of current learning analytics initiatives, but that have clear roots in stuff that is happening now, right? So not just talking about the initiatives as they're happening at our individual institutions, but really taking that and pushing it forward and looking at what learning analytics might look like in a few years after the technologies has been more developed, right? The other crucial component, though, was we wanted to ensure that these technologies and their impact could still be understood by the participants in the scenario, or in the focus groups, right? Uh, this whole exercise wouldn't have been valuable if the scenarios became too technology focused, too speculative, and students couldn't really see themselves represented in it. And then finally, we wanted to create scenarios that would re uh, resonate with administrators and their visions of learning analytics at their institutions, right, and uh, um, the future they saw there for those. So we really want, hopefully, these things to resonate with you all, right, where you can see things you might be thinking of and how they tie into the scenarios that we created. Yeah, and just real quick on this, there's a rich methodological history of doing scenario-based focus groups in the science and technology studies, and that's the, um, the literature uh, that we pulled from in order to develop um, our scenarios. Uh, and one of the underlying purposes is to position the students' perspectives and expectations of these socio-technical practices at the front or the upstream of their design so that when these socio-technical systems and practices do develop, do become mature, are actually used in libraries, they're informed by uh, the student perspective. So how did we develop these scenarios then? We had everyone in the research team basically create general ideas about what a scenario might be for this research and collected all of those via a worksheet so that we had some unified fields across all of those. We then had everyone review those uh, scenario ideas and use some card sorting activities to um, understand the relation of that scenario to libraries, right? We wanted these to be library focused and really resonate with you all. Um, and then also participant comprehensibility, right? We wanted to make sure, again, they were really clear to students what this technology was and what it was trying to do. Uh, we then uh, identify uh, sort of the scenario ideas based on the potential benefit of the technology, right? What was this technology going to get for libraries? And what were the potential privacy risks there, right? So that we could then uh, basically find three scenarios that we chose to develop for the research. Once we had those three ideas that sort of met all those criteria we were looking at, we broke up into subteams to conduct our literature review around the, the topics in that scenario, outlined the justification of the scenario, goals, benefits, and potential privacy harms as we saw them. So we could really try to develop a very robust idea of the scenario before we even began to figure out how we'd present it to students. Ah, sorry. Uh, apologies about that <laughs> technology. So the subteams then conducted the literature review, right? Outlined all of the ideas for that scenario, so that we really had a robust idea about what it was. So how did we design the scenario to be presented to the students? First, we uh, wrote an outline of the scenario, and I'll show you what those look like for the three scenarios in a bit. But just a, a sort of snapshot about what this was trying to do. We then outlined you know, exactly what it would be doing, examples of data that would be used in this process so that students had a really clear idea of what the, what was going into these systems, uh, what the goals of the technology were, right, what they were trying to, what the institution was trying to accomplish, and what their rationale for use was, right, like why were they going about doing that. We then, uh, this really begat the focus group portion of each of the scenarios. We started talking about trust, um, presented asked them, how do you feel about trust as it relates to the scenario? Provided some alterations to the scenario where we changed whether data was identifiable or de-identified, 
um, if it was used strictly for education purposes or more expansive, you know, any purposes, um, or if the data was being shared with just the library versus everyone at the university to try to get a sense of how did those factors change how people viewed trust. We then did basically the same thing for privacy, right? Talked about generally, how do people feel, is their privacy being respected in these scenarios? What do those alterations change about how they view privacy as it relates to that? And then finally, what is their consensus around privacy um, and how this technology would respect privacy? So the three scenarios that we focused on were first uh, what we call the library uh, management system, or really it is pushing all of the library services through the LMS so that data about the use of library services and resources can be tied together with Canvas and Blackboard data collected and then made available to analytic purposes. So really taking library use data, pairing that with data out of the LMS and making that available for librarians or other people as we alter the scenario to be able to analyze and then use, hopefully to improve teaching and learning. The next scenario dealt with the development of a library uh, data warehouse. So really this was centralizing student data across all the different systems that a library uses into a single data warehouse, which would enable library, uh, librarians to know resources, um, which services students were using, and would allow them to combine that library data with other data, perhaps sourced from the larger institution, like academic records or student profile information. And then really using that for analytic purposes. Uh, to understand that. And the final scenario we talked about, which we won't talk about when we get to the results uh, just due to time, was uh, geolocation tracking, which basically the university starting to use a system that compiles and organizes geolocation data. Um, sorry. Uh, it's stuff's flashing and it's throwing me off. <laughs> um, and really taking that geolocation data and then combining that with other student data, again, for analytic purposes as well. So as I mentioned, originally when we were scoping out this three-year research project, the idea was to conduct all of these uh, focus groups in person. Uh, as we all know, that was not possible because of the response to the COVID pan uh, pandemic. So we, were, we needed to reconvene, reconceive this as virtual focus groups that we were going to be conducted over Zoom. Um, this meant really detailed tracking of settings and logistics for those things and dealing with seven different institutions, various Zoom setups, which can actually vary immensely when you uh, look at how institutions have configured them. Uh, the nice thing though is that it allowed for broader participation by the researchers for the focus groups. So instead of just conducting my three and those being the only three focus groups that I witnessed, I was able to then sit in and take notes on researchers, uh, focus groups or at other institutions, right? So I found as a researcher that was really helped um, expand my understanding of how students felt about these things um, and helped me clear up some of the biases that might have come out just of my admittedly private and sort of outlier institution um, compared to some of our, our other research sites. And this did allow us to capture video and audio as well so that when we're analyzing these, we can go back and actually look at the video from the focus groups. Uh, we were lucky to be able to write up uh, sort of how we did this virtual focus groups um, in this forthcoming piece as well, which might be interested if you're looking to uh, work on focus groups virtually. So actually getting down to conducting the focus groups, how did we do it? We got 3,000 emails from each of the institution sites and then built a Qualtrics form to uh, allow people to sign up for focus groups. We basically sent reminders to that pool until 10 students were registered for each of the focus group times for each of the three. We set the threshold for conducting the focus groups at five, knowing based on some previous research we pro and our own experience, we'd probably have drop-offs and no-shows for people who had signed up for that. Uh, so we would hope to do five, and if we didn't have five people, reschedule the focus group. We did end up having to reduce it to four due to students, uh, one instance where a student dropped out after the focus group had already begun and no one had sort of realized that until afterward. So we completed the focus groups between March and May of 2021, with each site conducting three, 21 total. Uh, in total, we had 116 participants for the focus groups. They averaged about 40, we scheduled them for an hour, but they averaged about 44 minutes in length, which is n not surprising there when we look at, um, again, the research around doing those kind of focus groups. 
So all of the research documentation for the focus groups, the protocols, informed consent, recruitment, everything is available in our OSS site, which there's a link to at the bottom. Um, it also includes uh, information about how we develop those scenarios, uh, the slide decks for those scenarios as well. So you can see actually all of the information that we presented to students if you're curious. You can find a link to that right at the bottom. And with that, I'm going to hand it to Kyle to talk about the emerging findings that we've uh, uh, discovered so far. Yeah, first off, what we want to say is there is one caveat. This is research that is ongoing. We have done uh, probably our first 65 to 75% of analysis. Um, but as we dig into it a little bit more, we'll get some more descriptive um, depth uh, or breadth. We'll get some more theoretical depth as well. Um, our aim here is to finish everything by the end of February and submit, and then as soon as we can put a preprint into our OSF site, which is where we've deposited all of our research materials over the last three and a half, four years, um, you'll then be able to access our, our full complete findings then. So you can find out all of our information on our website at datadoubles.org. So we're gonna be talking about uh, two of the three scenarios, the LMS and the LDW uh, scenario, and we're going to leave our, out the TRK, the real-time location tracking um, scenario, um, primarily because the LMS and the LDW uh, scenarios are directly related to academic libraries and their uh, data capture and use practices as we have futurized them. So first off, the LMS, uh, Library Services Embedded uh, in the Le Learning Management System. So again, recall uh, that we had three general areas for each of these scenarios, the general question, um, the alterations, and the consensus, and uh, what we're seeing in the general question, um, the, the kind of reaction, if you will, to this particular scenario, we're seeing a lot more approval um, than disapproval as we have coded it, qualitatively coded it, uh, using max QDA. So we're seeing um, on the whole about 105 segments to 75 segments of, of disapproval. Um, but of course that quantification doesn't really mean a heck of a lot until you dig into it and, and figure out what, um, uh, what the qualities are of approval. So students tend, tended to think of this scenario as being uh, very much about, uh, or the data being very much about educational data about having educational purposes as being directly related to their educational experiences and the information not being very personal in nature, which is very important as we start to talk about the LDW um, scenario next. So it was for the most part a very acceptable scenario when the data and information were tightly connected to improving the students' experiences uh, and that the data were linked to education kind of broadly speaking. Um, so that's important to note that students are already carving out kind of use cases that are okay with them and use cases that are not okay with them. So there was a clear understanding by students of how looking at LMS data in library data that's embedded or connected to LMS data uh, could definitely aid students, right? It could improve library practices, um, lead to new technological advancements uh, that could help, you know, negotiate students or help students negotiate research practices um, within the library and connect those things uh, to their learning in classrooms. So a couple of quotes here from students that kind of explain uh, those findings. So the student says, I, th I think it makes it more understandable what information students are using and, and where they are better spending their time when it comes to resources that the library provides. So when it comes to them, this being the library, using it to develop a better understanding of their student population and the information that they use, I think that's completely valid. And I'm fine with that in my opinion. Similarly, a student says, it says that their main goals, it being the, the slide deck that we presented to them in terms of the justifications for the practice, it says that their main goals are to help students, to help librarians as well in the long run. So my kind of view on that is like, why not? So with regard to privacy and trust, um, there are some conditions here that are really important. They say that trust and privacy is respected in this scenario to the extent that data and analytics are focused on education, again, educational purposes that we addressed before, that the practices are transparent, and that data is unidentifiable. And this unidentifiable part is uh, very key, and it will follow again in the library data warehouse scenario. So they have trust in librarians who are accessing and using the data and more trust in them than other institutional actors, especially faculty were called out. They don't really have a, 
the same degree of trust in faculty that they're going to use uh, these types of data um, and these sources of data um, because faculty make judgments about them, right? And librarians are not seen as, as staff or faculty, depending on your campus, who actually judge students and have an, uh, a real say um, in their academic progress in terms of their grades. And, and this is important, I think, too, uh, a lot of the students are saying, well, up to this point, there's really no reason not to trust librarians and libraries, right? With regard to their privacy, they haven't had many privacy invasions or breaches or, or conflicts, however you might want to characterize it. Uh, and so they kind of look at this and they go, well, okay, yeah, we trust libraries to do this work. But students do express some concern about the data leaking outside of this particular system and this leakage breaches, um, attacks, however you want to characterize it, is very important to home in on as well. Um, because what they're saying is that, look, there's a specific purpose for how this data is going to be used by particular actors, and we're okay with that purpose and those actors. But as soon as things change, that's when we get a, a little concerned here. Um, and there is some skepticism that the data uses could change to advance uh, institutional, but not necessarily student interests, especially when libraries and institutions uh, start to partner uh, with third parties, which is ironic considering that our learning management system providers are third parties, right? So students aren't really seeing that connection very clearly, at least in the data that we have. So students say that, you know, I think that either based on because I've never paid attention or because it's never become a problem, uh, the library and the university respect my privacy enough um, that I've never been concerned about it. I know that they have data and it's never been a problem, but I don't know how much I think companies as a whole respect my privacy. Companies are not known for caring about individuals, and this completely reflects what we saw in the phase one interviews with students. They also say, you know, most people seem to believe that library and university will generally have their best interests in mind. I'm of the same opinion, but then they start to talk about third parties. So is there a consensus on what conditions are necessary for the scenario to be sustainable in the, the long run? So these, when we start to focus students on saying, hey, here's the goal, we've got to develop a consensus. What are the things that you all agree on, right? This is what they say. They want granular consent. They want de-identified data by default with options to opt in to identifiable data gathering. They want to know the specific collection practices so that they can review them and have a say about them when they do consent or choose not to. They want to know about the specific uses, the access rules considering, uh, concerning what institutional actors will be able to gain access to uh, the data. Again, this is because of their concern with perhaps faculty gaining access to it. Uh, and they want consent reminders and multiple opportunities to change their consent choice. Again, it has to be for educational purposes. Um, and students realize, though, that they need to take some personal responsibility for understanding their consent choices. They need to read any documentation that's provided by the library or the institution regarding consent. They also want to audit uh, the data that's available to the library. And they want to know how that data has been used by the library and by whom and for what purposes. They want to kind of keep a trail or be able to track down that trail of, of data uh, usage. And they want personal access to their own data. You know, they obviously, they time and again say their own data in kind of a, a, a property sense, right? That's something that we can discuss. Do students actually own data that is collected or created by the institution? That's actually a very controversial point. Um, they say if it was unidentifiable, and we couldn't be tracked to be, then maybe you know that would be okay. Um, unfortunately, due to time, I'm gonna skip uh, through some of these a little bit because I do wanna make time for discussion here. So the library data warehouse scenario. So uh, one of the things that I wanna point out here is that when thinking about the LDW scenario, think of it as an iteration on the LMS, right? The LDW, the library data warehouse scenario, introduces more data sources, that data is, is more granular, and data are now aggregated um, across multiple systems and are more broadly shared and made analyzable to uh, other institutional actors. So we're kind of expanding the scope here, if you will. And as we put into the scenario, uh, you're identifiable by default. Like that is the purpose of this data warehouse, to identify you, to analyze data about you. 
So do students approve of the scenario? Well, according to the coded segments, again, quantification is a limited measure here, but there's a little bit more disapproval, uh, or sorry, more disapproval than uh, approval, but it's a pretty even split when you just look at the segments. And like with the LMS um, scenario, uh, students saw how that scope was enlarged with the uh, scenario, with the LUW scenario in comparison with the LMS one. Um, they saw how their behaviors could be captured in a much more detailed way. Um, but they also recognized how it could be beneficial for education kind of writ large to do this type of analysis. And they saw some logic behind collecting the data uh, to improve library services and resources, but they had some concerns. So this student says, it sort of rubs me the wrong way a little bit. I think that there could definitely be some helpful services offered based on what I've checked out or what I've asked about that's captured in the, the warehouse here. But I don't know. I think any like revealing information about time or location, I don't know, makes me uncomfortable. Feels like a weird, you know, kind of tracking thing. The student says, I feel like there are other tools that they could get used to get the information that they want that doesn't involve just collecting large amounts of data from students. And the other student says, but if it was just turning over all data collected without like a specific reason, um, then I don't think I would trust that. So do students think this scenario respects their privacy and trust? Again, students express clear trust in libraries here. Uh, and there was an obvious sentiment that librarians care about students. Libraries have students' uh, interests in mind uh, and that they want to improve the learning outcomes for students, which they can see a connection between the data warehouse work and creating programs and services from the analysis of that data that can improve their education. But, um, and I thought this was very interesting, uh, the students do realize that this is just data phishing in a lot of ways. It's just collecting up all the data that's available for possible uses, some of which are unclear to students, and it could be unnecessarily broad and that needs a justification. And there are concerns, again, about wider access. So with the LMS, they were concerned about faculty. Now there's much wider access in terms of institutional actors, and they uh, kind of honed in on that um, in terms of their privacy uh, concerns. A couple of quotes here. I do trust them, them being the library, because I mean libraries are supposed to help you. It's supposed to be something safe for the students. They don't, the student says, I don't see anything wrong collecting, with collecting my information, and I trust the library generally. Um, and if it's a university library, I trust them even more. Within the library then, I don't think I would have an issue with the information being shared. Again, the scoping here is important. Within the library, that's the key term. Um, and this other student says uh, similar, it's just within the library, so I would trust it. They, gar they start to segment the, the data sources out and they say, okay, um, you know, or the data types and they say, okay, but it's getting very personal information here and I am not necessarily uh, comfortable with that. And the student says, I feel that if our personal information such as location, phone number, name, and even email address is collected by the library, university, or, or companies, I think that means that our privacy is clearly not respected. We could have a conversation with the student about all the various definitions of privacy, but this is this student's perspective. So what are the conditions that make this sustainable? Again, granular consent came up, uh, auditing mechanisms, access to one's data, just like with the LMS scenario. But for the LDW scenario, the bottom line was if consent is not an option, then de-identification uh, needs to be the standard practice. Well, a lot of us, or probably all of us in the room know that de-identification, especially when you have a lot of different data sources uh, and types, um, is very hard to uh, protect against re-identification. They want to be consulted. They want to have agency. They want to have some choice making uh, in what's going on with this library data warehouse uh, and that they want the consent mechanism, again, uh, made available to them, but especially to make that consent mechanism intelligible and short, you know, not a Facebook terms of service thing. That's not what we're talking about here. They're, they want something that is in a couple of pages or so that they can read and really take action on. And they wanted notifications about when the data in the warehouse was used uh, and for what ends. Uh, and they wanted more justifications from the library as to why they're collecting the data. Uh, a couple of students also stated a desire to expunge data post-graduation, which I think is very interesting. They want to delete their data trail, as it were. Um, of course, that's problematic when you need historical data to do some types of analyses. 
So again, some of these quotes just uh, reiterate what I just said. They want communication um, from the library. They want that to be very clear and not just to do it once and expect people to really remember. Remind them of what you're doing with the data. Remind them that they have a choice if you give them a choice um, to consent. Again, show them exactly what's being tracked and how much. And now I want to get into some discussion points. Um, and hopefully we have a few minutes for, for Q&A from you all too. So one of the things that we're talking about in the research team is that libraries have the savings of trust, perhaps a larger savings of trust than the institution does, and especially more than, than companies and other third parties do. And what happens here is that with the savings of trust, if you break that trust, of course you lose that savings. You don't have that goodwill anymore, and that's problematic. As Mike and I were talking about, we feel like if you lose that savings of trust, it's gonna have knock-on effects for other services that you offer to students. To what extent will students be willing then to come into the library or engage with reference librarians or go to information literacy sessions if you've had a massive data breach from your library data warehouse? It's just one scenario. Again, this educational purpose um, point Coming from the students is, is really important, especially given what we've seen in the literature about how to use this data for political or, or financial gains from the library or even the institution. And students really key in on that, and they're just not all right with that, right? So the justifications are not, we're using your data to make money, we're using your data to improve necessarily um, our cost savings in a purchase of some type of database or material. They want to see how you're connecting your data collection and use and analysis to actual educational outcomes. And since they want to be consented, obviously they want to engage in your practices. They want to have a say in what is okay and what is not okay, and to have, in some ways, a, a discussion with you uh, if you're pursuing learning analytics, and especially these two types of um, scenarios. And that's an autonomy concern. Finally, it comes down to, to consent. That's what this comes down to. We did not say consent in any of our scenarios. We did not prime them to say consent. They said consent. They engaged in that discussion. All we did was say, well, what do you mean by consent? What, do, what are the conditions around consent that you want? The problem is, is that historically, uh, higher education institutions and the libraries within those institutions do not have a way to enable consent. There's very little technological infrastructure build up built up to uh, enable consent. And the way we practice consent is typically related to research. And in the case of the evaluation and assessment practices that we do within a library, that's not traditional research that requires consent in a lot of ways. We do a lot of all of this information gathering within the institution already without asking students if they're okay with it and what kind of rights they feel like they should have to it. We have no, so we don't have the historical background, we don't have the technological infrastructure, we don't really have the legal motivation to do this. I don't know if we have the political motivation to do consent because that could reduce the access to data that we may want within the institution and that's problematic. So my question, and I would love to hear some feedback on this because I'm kind of stuck at this point, is like what motivates you all to actually pursue a consent mechanism for students? How does that look? Is that practical? That's really important because after three and a half years, I think this is what it comes down to in this research is that students want to be consented. They want to talk about this. Now the question's on us as librarians and administrators and you know, institutional leaders, how are we going to respond to this? So just some guided questions for you. Feel free to answer these or ask us anything you may have, but we have some time to talk, and of course, Mike and I are, are definitely willing to talk after this session, uh, mm -hmm. if you'd like. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a, <laughs> thank you. And yes, there's a mic in the middle, if you could use that, if you have questions. Hey, thank you so much for the research. Thank you. Um, so two things, one is an observation, which is with most of our institutional privacy policies, I think we are already in a blanket way that most students probably never look at, saying we will collect your data mm -hmm. yeah. in order to improve your experience and our programs. So there's a sort of like, how do we educate students about the fact that that's happening? 
And then my other thought is really around the, what you flagged in the, in the focus groups around um, mistrust of the faculty teaching the courses. And that seems like a deeper cultural challenge that needs to be resolved. And I just would welcome any reflections you have about that, where that power dynamic is, where students are feeling that. Mm -hmm. If that relationship isn't trust-based, um, then probably that's the linchpin and anything else that's happening around that relationship sure. is more tenuous. So I'd welcome just what your, your reflections have been. Yeah, I think one of the big things with the, the fact and the, the notion that they sort of trusted librarians, trusted us more than faculty, and I think it came up, uh, especially as we talked with uh, outside of the institution as well, sharing it, students really do not want their data to be used as a mechanism to judge and or punish them. Um, and in particular, one that keeps coming back to me uh, at my institution, we had one where a student was re-identified by a photo for participating in a student protest, and that became a non-starter for them. Nothing the university could ever do would reinstate that trust that they had that was violated there. So I think, uh, and as, as Kyle kind of said, the fact that librarians are viewed as these sort of neutral parties, for lack of a better term, I don't know that I fully agree with that, um, we're not going to we're not going to judge them. So they immediately defaulted to a well. You probably want that to improve something, right? Buy better books, more appropriate books, better databases, those things. And and the door wasn't really open for it to become a, a sort of mechanism to to evaluate. Yeah, I mean, I coming out not we're not out of the pandemic. Let's be clear about this. But getting on the other side of some things, I wonder if students um, really should trust us anymore. I mean. Cliff uh, touched on this uh, with the online proctoring. We have, as institutions, put students in harmful positions. Not all institutions, but put them in har harmful positions by forcing them to engage with particular uh, technological infrastructure and artifacts. Um, so I think we're already losing some of that trust um, coming on this other side of, of the pandemic. Uh, in, in you know, libraries, you're in a good place. Faculty, like myself, I'm an LIS online educator. I feel like I have to do more to earn that trust back and say, this is how I'm gonna treat you, this is what I've done to protect you. Um, and I think perhaps more of our faculty need to do that, so. Hey, uh, Roger Schoenfeld from Ithgas and Art. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the presentation and uh, the research and, and the framing around consent, which I think is really, really interesting. Um, I, I'm struggling a little bit with how to, you know, you've, you've sort of framed out a kind of moral imperative here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm struggling a little bit with how to um, put that into dialogue with the way that institutional alignment works in like actual organizational contexts, right? So there's a lot of, um, a lot of discussion about, you know, how libraries um, you know, need to be in alignment with the strategic directions that their mm -hmm. universities are, are moving in. And, you know, as you know, in some cases anyway, universities are moving in the direction of, for example, caring deeply about student success, retention, graduation, progression, et, et cetera. And for better or for worse, one of the tools that they've, some institutions have chosen, chosen to use is, uh, is, is a sort of learning analytics framework. So, um, so I'm, and students may or may not want to be monitored through those, those platforms, as I think you've done a nice job of, of articulating. So how does the library in that scenario engage, right? The provost is saying, the president is saying, whoever, you know, the, the, the number one priority or, you know, one of our top three priorities is retention, progression, graduation. We've adopted this strategic direction, learning analytics, et cetera. And, and I've heard library directors, not many, but a few, in that kind of an organizational context say, I'm not gonna do it, okay? And I can think of at least one case where that person is no longer employed as a library director, okay? So I, I guess what I'm wondering is like, can you, can you put this kind of moral imperative into a bit of a sort of organizational framework of that sort and help us understand what, what you're calling for in, in that kind of um, circumstance. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think uh, one of the first things I want to acknowledge, there are definitely power dynamics that are at play, and often libraries are going to be profoundly disadvantaged if the university wants to pursue learning analytics as a way of justifying to, again, places they might have to be that like a state legislator, le legislature for uh, schools, right? Uh, the libraries doesn't have a lot of power to bring in those sort of negotiations. And as you said, yeah, you could say no, and you could just as easily find yourself outside of a job. Uh, so I think it's really important that we frame, we take our professional values and the things that we think are really important for librarians, and we're able to articulate those and show those, um, show how those values tie to like research like this, right, and how we would react to these things, and understand that we may still be forced to participate in that, hand over data, do those kind of things, but I think at a minimum we can always guarantee we position ourselves as experts when it comes to things like student privacy, right, um, really engaging students um, and really becoming sort of partners with them with that. So even if we're uh, as institutions sort of strong-armed, as it were, into participating in large-scale data aggregation and analysis, I think we can still at least bring these issues to bear for the institution. And that might not change the needle, but I think it at least uh, affords us an opportunity to have a dialogue around those things. Yeah, it's a difficult question. I mean, bringing in the morality of learning analytics and trying to tie that into the mission of the institution is difficult when the, the moral center of many higher education institutions has disintegrated in a lot of ways. To be just focused on retention and graduation and um, success metrics that are more financially and politically aligned than they are having to do with educational learning and outcomes, right? Like retention is a proxy. It doesn't actually tell you if anybody has learned anything. So the question I would push, or the way I would push back on that is I would try to get the administrative team or whoever is bringing that to, ta to the table to say, okay, well, what do you mean by retention? Yes, it's a quantification of something, but is it retention for what goal? What outcome, right? And if it is about student learning, then we don't want to change the conditions around learning using data practices that change students' behaviors, puts them into like a, a chilled type of experience where they don't feel like they can actually openly engage with their peers and their faculty because they're being data datafied, right? We want them, if, if that is the concern, then consent is one way to kind of break that down because we're actually creating a discussion and students are willing to be datafied in some ways because they've said that's okay. And then you don't have some of the harms that maybe you would otherwise. So I, I don't know if that, that makes a heck of a lot of sense, but I just feel like consent is the way to create morality around the data practices, even if the data practices are for financial purposes. Uh. Yeah, and I, I think a lot about how um, my institution, which is you know, a, a private institution, Retention and GPA are not things my institution looks at or cares about. Um, they, I understand completely why they do for other places. Um, that's taken the form more with a focus on the student experience, right, mm -hmm. and student well-being, right, is another one. And those are things that, especially as we are still in the midst of the pandemic, institutions are caring deeply about and become really important. And I think that might be another way if we can shift the conversation from just those metrics like retention and GPA to something you know deeper and bigger, right? That the experience and the well-being of those students that also opens the door to talk about these things in a different way, because you can talk about like sure we could possibly learn things out of these analytic practices, right? But we also could do potential harm to students by you know datafying them by having that chilling effect. Um, or just potentially by collecting data that could be exposed in a data breach, right? Did very real world ramifications. So I think that might be another way to kind of change the, the frame of the conversation um, to get at these deeper uh, issues. Yeah, I, I just think consent is care. I think that's what it comes down to. If you give students an opportunity to consent to these practices, it demonstrates that you actually care about them as individuals, as human beings who have rights, right? And, and I think that's going to drive up those that, that sense of trust that people yeah. have both in libraries and in, in those institutions. And you know, part of what we do uh, is not only to provide an education to people, but is to provide, you know, to be part of something, right? To, to be part of that institution, to be part of that institution's history um, and what it does going forward. Th those are crucially important. 
So I, I think that's really, really important. I, I'll, I'll just say, I think one of the threads that you, you just kind of both spoke to a little bit is the fact that some institutions have different dynamics <laughs> than others, right? So in the case where it's all about student experience, you know, maybe the, the benefit of datifying someone or the threshold for consent for that person might be different than at a school where the implicit, the, the, the argued trade is, hey, we're gonna increase the, the graduation rate from 32% to 65%. Is it worth it to you in that case? Right, you might have a different kind of focus right. group outcome at that school than at a, at a different kind of school. So anyway, I'll sit down, but thank you so much. Oh yeah, no, yeah, and I, I think sure. that's a real good point too. And uh, something that uh, I, I think we saw in some of the more, I would say like astute, where you had focus groups where participants had clearly thought about these issues, uh, some, a lot of times the sort of lack of uh, government oversight of this and an acknowledgement that absent that, maybe one institution can change, but really without that, wholesale, you're gonna run into those problems where each institution has slightly different cultures and slightly different expectations and looking to achieve different things. All right, we'll end it there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone.